Hello, everybody. Um, it's just gone two o'clock, so I think um, we're going to be starting very shortly. There's just some housekeeping rules that are actually on your screen right now, but I'm just going to give a quick um, run through. So this session is, is Archaeology for Everybody, uh, engaging audiences, and it's part of CIFA's Innovation Festival. Um, it's been recorded, so um, all recordings are going to be available to the festival delegates as soon as possible after the session. Now, we're going to have to make some edits probably, so um, thank you for your patience in advance, but we'll get them up as soon as, and out to you as soon as we can. Please keep your microphones on mute during the presentations. Um, if you're happy to keep your cameras on, that's great. Uh, it's nice to see some faces in the audience, but um, it is recorded, so you might not want to be um, recorded for posterity. Um, and also, we know that people have other things going on in the background. I'm, I'm live from my kitchen at the moment, and who knows who might pass, pass through there during the course of the afternoon. There's going to be opportunities for questions um, during the session uh, at the end of the talks, but please make sure of uh, use of the chat facility at the bottom. You can put any questions in there. And um, when we get to the Q&A or the discussion sessions, I'll run through and see if I can pick any up. But if you want to talk and ask your question yourself, please raise your virtual hand um, to speak and wait to be invited. Um, if you can't find your virtual hand, then you can, uh, you can put your camera on and you can, you can wave and we'll try and, we'll try and spot you. Um, now we want today to be a, a positive experience, obviously for everyone. We obviously welcome discussion and debate. This is what today's all about. But we ask you to show respect, courtesy and consideration to everybody who's here. And um, we don't obviously don't want to have to ask anybody to leave or remove everyone. We can do it, but we don't want to. So please do be respectful to everybody. There is a, sh a scheduled break. Um, it's later on in the session. It's going to be round about um, four o'clock-ish. Um, but if you need to, to stop before that, um, there'll be little breaks between uh, speakers if you need to dash up and get a quick cup of tea or something like that. And the speakers are going to be their absolute best to keep the timings um, that we've set out in the, the timetable. So um, our last presentation, just to uh, forewarn you, is going to be a recorded talk and the speaker is hopefully going to be joining us afterwards for live Q&A. So um, I think that's everything. And um, I hope you enjoy today and we get some lots, a lot of good debate and questions out of it. We've got a variety of speakers um, and what I'm going to do is actually let the speakers, rather than me try and introduce the speakers, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves as they, as they speak. So the first person we've got up is Martin Lowcock, um, who was from the University of St. David's. His talk is early career to specialist, the apprenticeship option. And those of you who the, were here this morning um, during the first session have heard quite a lot about apprenticeships already. And this is about some of the higher apprenticeships that you can do. So welcome, Martin. Thank you. Um, right, okay, I, I believe you can now see see a screen um, with the presentation on it. Um, I should start off by saying that uh, I've put the presentation, uh, oops, sorry, no, you can't, there, you should be able to now. Um, Thank you. Uh, I put the presentation and a couple of other documents in the um, in the files area at the bottom of the session page. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so uh, that's where they are. So if you, if you need to take notes, well, you don't need to take notes about that. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the board of what I put in put in, the, in this in this what I'm trying to cover in this session is two things. One is to explain a bit about the, about apprenticeships and specifically the archaeological specialist apprenticeship, in terms of um, uh, you know this this is a, a, a way for people to um, develop their skills and um, de develop their their career. And as I say, looking at the early well, people who are making that jump from early career to whatever comes next, mid career, I guess. Um, uh, so yeah, so so that so not entry level, but the next thing about you know, uh, people thinking about how how that develops, and obviously that's in in terms of um, uh, the the way that the archaeological workforce develops. We know that a lot of people don't make that jump, um, and so this has a role within that. 
So that's one thing I'm going to, I'm going to look at is that content of that, that apprenticeship. And then I'm going to um, include at the end some reflections on um, uh, how, how we can go about um, teaching and learning about, uh, particularly around soft skills, um, using an online medium. And uh, everybody recognized, I think that's a bit of a challenge. And so I've, I'm just going to run through as a little case study of uh, what we've done to try and make sure that we are actually giving the people the, the skills they need. OK. So ah, here we go. So for the people who weren't, weren't here this morning, <laughs> what is an apprenticeship? Um, it's vocational training for a, a specific job role. Um, so in um, so, yeah, so basically identify what the job role is, identify what the, what the um, uh, uh, what competencies are required for someone doing that role, um, and then the training covers those competencies. Uh, the the training element is is either completely government funded or or very heavily subsidised, ninety five percent subsidised. So it's so it's a very good deal in terms of um, uh, an upskilling um, uh, thing for, for staff development, both from an employer's point of view and from the the trainee's point of view. Um, that you know, some in some in some places um, you have you're, you're expected to pay for your own staff development, and uh, um, as I say in, in this case, it's not it's not an issue. Um, uh, an apprenticeship doesn't have to be a specific role that's being created for a new a new a new employee. It can be an existing member of staff who just goes on it as, as an upskilling exercise. And an apprenticeship is studied during work time, so it's not someone doing a full time job and then doing some. You know, half day study um, uh, in in the evenings or whatever. It's not an evening class. It's work. The idea is, you're when you're an apprentice, you're there at work. Part of it is actually doing the work, and part of it is doing the learning. But it all counts as work uh, legally, I should say. <laughs> There's lots of rules about that. Okay, um, and the, the 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 range of available apprenticeship standards at the moment uh, in England. Uh, uh, the, the, the two at the top there, we've got the technician level three, uh, level three is equivalent to A level or various MBQs at that level, BTEX, um, and the archaeological specialist level seven, that's master's level, so um, we'll hear more about that in a minute. Um, then we've also got historic advice and the cultural heritage conservation um, roles as well. So you've got this, this, this family of, of, of stands that are currently available. Uh, so specifically, the one, the one that I'm talking about is the Archaeological Specialist Level 7. Um, this is a programme that is, is built on doing an, an MA. As, as that's, the, that's where how the training is delivered. It's delivered through an MA. Um, and at uh, the University of Wales, Trinity St David, um, which is a, a, a university that's grown out of what used to be Lampeter, you, you see from the from the screen. We've just celebrated our two hundredth birthday, um, uh, but we yeah, so we changed names about five times in those two hundred years. Um, uh, but yeah, so we're currently delivering this um, uh, to, uh, to a cohort of uh, students, and we're currently the only provider for this uh, for this program. So, what is this level seven program? It's intended for. I'll kind of put on the screen there new project officers, stroke fines officers, stroke whatever, um, people who we, we would see them probably working at um, associate level in terms of um, uh, CIFA membership. Um, basically, we're, pe we're people who are beginning to become responsible for doing analysis and reporting on, on archaeological data. Um, so they're moving moving on from that sort of data creation stage, whether that's sort of initial fines process, press processing, or working on site and doing initial recording, we're now looking at people who are people who are taking on responsibility for um, uh, actually understanding the, the and, and reporting on um, the archaeological significance of what of what they've what, what they've um, done. Okay, um, the the way the course is structured, we've got modules on research methods, project planning and delivery, project reporting, specialist practice, and a dissertation. Um, so you can see we're basically we're common to all archaeological specialism this is basically the project life cycle or um, all, all all specialists whatever they're doing um, will be involved in doing some planning and then in implementing the work then analyzing the results reporting the results and archiving that's that's common to common right across um, across the um, or across whatever role it is uh, and it's delivered as an on online MA, as I've said. Um, we actually teach it as a, uh, we have a Wednesday morning Zoom session, a three hour, three hour Zoom session uh, where we um, 
uh, where everybody meets up, uh, so, so one, one day a week, um, and it takes uh, three years. Uh, as I say, in terms of specialisms, it can be very broadly defined, but um, uh, the ones we currently have represented on the programme, we've got someone who's, uh, who's uh, going to be a medical pottery specialist, we've got someone who works in, in maritime and marine science, um, and then we've got people who are working within what more conventional field work roles, um, uh, where um, either looking at post ex projects or just general, generally being a, um, a, a project project manager, project officer. Um, and but we, we, we could equally well be supporting people who are doing things like building survey, paleo work or geophysics. Um, the, the nature of the course means that any of those could be slotted in perfectly well. They all go through a project life cycle. They all have a body of practice that people need to engage with. Um, and that they, you know, and they then need to, um, you know, make sure that they're meeting those requirements in terms of in, as they undertake their work. Okay, and the the, not the course content I've described in terms of modules. That's the way the university thinks of it. As far as the apprenticeships are con concerned, it's we're talking about knowledge, skills, and behaviours. I said at the start that thing about defining what the job role was and getting you ready for it. Um, so wait till you have a shopping list of, I think in this case, it's about 21 knowledge, skills and behaviours, which they which are required to successfully undertake a, um, that role. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of what they are later on, but they're quite, they, they, they sound quite vague. Um, they, um, they're at least left quite open about, about what they actually mean. Um, but an example of the actual content of the course, I've got a long list of things that we've covered <laughs> so far um, in the first year um, uh, in terms of lots of acronyms, lots of different bits and pieces. These are all bits of um, information that you need to understand in order to perform your professional practice correctly. Um, uh, and so obviously people will have engaged with some of these before um, as, as a sort of data collection level. Um, but what, what they may not, for example, like with health and safety, people will, will have been encountered health and safety on, on numerous sites and that they will have been um, told what to do and whatever. But they may not have been involved in actually preparing risk assessments. They may not have been or, 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 um, or that sort of higher level understanding how um, the specific bits of practice fit into the, the broader legislative framework. Um, so, yeah, so, that, so that's the sort of content, that middle, middle paragraph there is that big chunk there. Um, and overall, what we keep coming back to is what we're trying to do is develop people's professional judgment and practice. We're trying to get people to, to, to um, have a go at saying, OK, you've got an ethical or professional dilemma here. You know, you need to ascribe significance to a, to a particular sort of site. So we decide whether it needs to be excluded from the development or not. How do you go about that? What, what, what is the judgment call? How can we get beyond just saying, well, there's a gut feeling that someone who knows all about this area will ultimately, you know, if, if someone sees a mosaic, um, you know, everybody's like, oh, it's brilliant, it's a mosaic. Uh, a mosaic specialist would look at that and, and they would know um, what criteria to apply to actually say, well, is this a really important one or is this just a one of the mill one? Um, you know, that, that, so that's, that's what we're trying to get at, is we're trying to equip our, our, our apprentices with that, um, that use of using their professional judgment and being able to rely on it. Because by the end of this course, um, and once they've completed their, their, their apprenticeship, um, that certainly I think their employers will be expecting them to be going off and leading projects by themselves and making those professional calls routinely um, and getting them right. Okay, so that's the um, that that's that specifically, you know, the, the question of of you know, sort of what the archaeological specialist um, uh, apprenticeship is. Um, and I hope I've given you a flavour for that. There's a bit more information in in the uh, there's a leaflet, um, uh, say in, in in the in the file area, um, which the, which explains a bit more. Um, and I'm happy to <laughs> explain at length what, what's involved. You know, we've got pages of stuff about this. Um, but yeah, moving on now to sort of the, you know, sort of some of the, um, uh, you know, sort of in terms of innovations, in terms of how we've had to innovate in terms of delivering this program. So, I mean, the first, first thing is, you know, we, you know, we, we, you know, we used to be a, a classroom university um, and now we are mostly a classroom university with a little bit of distance learning provision. Um, but uh, but so this particular program moved completely online. In fact, we'd already decided to move it online before COVID hit. Um, I mean, everybody else caught up with us basically. 
Um, and the reason why we moved is that, is, that, is that employers said it was very disruptive, expecting people to be sent away for a week to, 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 to for a study block. Um, this made people trying to timetable field work um, made their lives very difficult. So they were much happier to release someone for a day a week. Um, if I'd been one of the employers, I would have said, no, that's crazy, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, well, I wasn't. So um, that, that's what they said. Um, but it's less, you know, it is less disruptive. It's, it's you know, it's, it, you, if necessary, it's possible for people to um, uh, sit in a car on site and still take part in the, um, uh, uh, you know, via satellite and take part in, in the sessions. Um, or what they can, if they can, if they definitely can't attend, what they can do is they can uh, look, look at the recordings. Um, it's cheaper, you know, people don't have to move physically around around the country. It's quite important that we provide coverage for people who cover anywhere in England. Um, so, you know, sort of it, it would be easily easy for people to be having to travel 100 miles, 200 miles in order to attend one of the sessions. So it's, it's much cheaper not, not to do that. Um, and it's much more accessible because you don't need, need to physically be there. It means that it means that people who, who find it hard to travel around is much, hard, is, is much better for them. Oh, I see there's a spelling mistake there, but uh, there you go. Um, okay, disadvantages moving online. Um, one of the real things that we knew we were going to be missing out on with this programme is that, you know, the value of a programme like this, bringing together employees from different organisations and different roles, talking to each other, you know, a lot of the learning that they would get is not from um, uh, us as academics on the so we do have a background in the profession, but you know, but actually, it's learning from each other. And one of the, you know, one of the disadvantages of moving online is that we lost that, um, or we have to work quite hard to um, create the sort of value that would automatically really, really be generated from being in person and seeing the same gang of people um, uh, time after time over the over a course of three years. Um, so yeah, that, the group, missing out on group work uh, um, or making sure that we still do some group work, even though it's a bit, a bit, a bit harder. Uh, and obviously, we miss out from all the, all the informal interactions, all the all the um, side conversations people have when they're brought together, which may again may be just as valuable as the formal learning. Um, physical resources, books, yeah, you can't have, can't get hold of books. I mean, luckily, a lot of the resources these days are electronic or available as ebooks, so that's not perhaps not quite such an issue. Um, but with certainly with the, some of the older stuff, um, it is an issue. And uh, technical issues, um, you know, we have, although broadly speaking, Teams is a fairly reliable pr platform. Um, we do have a continual series of uh, niggles um, as we go through of people losing connections or di disappearing or, or the whole thing going wrong. Um, and uh, there's been a discussion with, within the univer universities in general about the impact of COVID, about, about the effect on student engagement. And certainly people to start with, um, there were a lot of students who um, didn't engage at all with online teaching. So they, they, would, they, would, they would theoretically be there, but in practice they weren't, or they, well, certainly they weren't paying attention. Um, actually, I, I, I think, you know, but the, equally so people have turned it around and say, well, actually, um, if you have a lecture room full of full of bored people, <laughs> you may not be getting any engagement there. You know, they're physically there, but they're not mentally there. Um, and that actually, um, if you're actually having an online uh, an online call program, which um, people are engaged, you know, are, are genuinely taking part in, that's better. That's better concentration you're getting than you would from from uh, being in a, in a lecture hall. So I said, there's some general issues, sort of certainly that you know that, we, that we've picked up on. Um, so I, I've, I've messed up the sequence of this, but here we go. Um, so yeah, so what in terms of the th things like the, 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 the specifically the archaeological specialist program. Um, so let's just list some of the um, challenges and benefits which people have reported from this of the employers and employees. Um, one of the challenges has been the employers being committed that that this, this is a this, they're committing a, a day a week of, of someone's paid time to undertake this this staff development. Um, that 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 is a big ask for them, and certainly, um, you know, when you've got more than one uh, uh, apprentice from an employer, um, that is a you know, that is a big big commitment they're making. Uh, there is a big question about timetabling with work commitments. Um, it's always, I mean, I should say, I used to be a project manager, and I'm used to the nightmare of trying to timetable. Um, people's work, work programs anyway um, and this is just one extra thing that you need to think about so that is that is a you know, there's no there's no getting away with that that is that is a problem um, benefits 
that it is helpful for people to actually come out of their workplace and actually have a think about why it is they're actually doing what they're doing. I think that's that you know you could say that you know that is a bit helpful and certainly to learn what other people are doing does make make you suddenly think well is this recording system the best recording system? There's other recording systems out there um, which people are using perfectly happily. You know can can we see if there's there's some scope to to improve? Um, increased confidence that the the, the the participants in the program have reported that they, they're much more confident about their use of their professional judgment because they feel they understand not just the, the immediate question, but, the, but the, the landscape within that question is being asked. And uh, increased quality of work. Again, people say, well, actually, it's quite helpful. This has this actually sharpened up my, my, my right, particularly my writing skills, uh, my referencing skills, my, my research skills. Um, because you know I've, I've had to do this for academic purposes and it's actually been very useful in my work and people have said that the the, the work scenarios we presented with them has been helpful because they replicate what happens in the real world okay and then so we asked the apprentices what what they what they'd learned from the course and uh, um, <coughs> Uh, this, these, these, these are their answers. A greater understanding of our practice in the real world. I think however, however hard universities try, it's very difficult for them to um, uh, uh, provide that. And again, that comparative thing about having different employers in the room, different, different roles, different, different experiences. Um, looking at ethics and ethics in practice, I mean, it's, it's very easy to sign up to the code of conduct and say, yes, I'm, I'm a good archaeologist. But what do we actually do in reality when we're faced with an ethical dilemma? Um, we've actually run through that in the several different scenarios now, and people are getting used to how you how you can successfully navigate to a professional outcome, uh, even if you're in a circumstance where a perfect solution isn't available. Um, so a range of methods and software within the commercial sector, again, sort of people realizing there's lots more out there than just what they've been told by their employer. Um, archaeological theory, uh, we've tied archaeological theory to the whole issue around, around sort of equity, Black Lives Matter, um, basically saying like you know, the, the, the notion of public engagement, community engagement, that you know, we, we've, 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 what we've tried to do is make sure that um, it, it's clear that archaeology sits within a social context um, and that we need to be aware of that um, in, in when we're making our decisions. Um, archiving and metadata, yeah, I mean, uh, as, as a geek, I, I'd say I, mean, that I, I love that anyway, but um, people need to, you know, may, may not realise that they, they like that. Um, and there we are, so engaging with other professionals at the same stage of career, again, opportunity for, for to sharing best practice. Okay, so this, this, these are the, the knowledge, um, as I mentioned about the knowledge, skills and behaviours, or KSBs, as everyone talks, talks about them all the time. And you can see that they're, they're a shopping list of um, effectively like a job description. These are the, these are the sort of the, the, the things you need to be able to do. Um, uh, and as I said, that they are quite um, uh, generically worded. And then what we have to do is pick out what we actually want, want to cover. Um, but so I've just picked out um, sort of a couple of the soft skills which are buried in those KSBs. So here we, here we go, sort of not the knowledge nine, ensuring effective communications and relationships within a project team. And, set, and skill six is working effectively in a team. Now, I mean, I think it, you know, in any case, you would be looking at that and wondering how can we effectively teach that? It's, it's very difficult to teach that, um, teach those skills. Um, and, and, you know, more broadly, um, employers these days are very, very keen on soft skills. People with good soft skills are, are valuable and need, need to be um, uh, sort of uh, kept, kept, yeah, kept in an organisation. Uh, but how do we get to the position where people have good soft skills in a work context? Um, that is tricky. It's just tricky to develop these skills. Um, so how can, how can you do it and how can you do it online? So that's really sort of the challenge that, um, that we were faced with. So what we did was we extracted from those generic things about how do you, you know, being, basically being part of a team, Okay, what are the key skills within that, buried within that, within the, the area of being a good teamwork? Uh, so contributing to discussions, um, chairing meetings, and reaching consensus. Um, so those are the things that, that we expect people to be able to do. If they can do that, then they're probably a good team player. Being a good contributor, 
as you provide your knowledge and perspective, you, you speak up if you want to, if there's, you've got something relevant to add, listen to other people engaging with discussion. Being a good chair is a skill that is very difficult to develop. So the only way you can do it is by practicing it so that you make sure that you understand what you need to do, introducing a topic, gathering other people's views, exploring where there's differences, establishing consensus. These are difficult things to learn. So what we, in order to deliver that, what we, what we did was we developed a scenario where basically we assigned everybody um, uh, within their individual job roles, the scenarios in, in, in the files area, um, identified people with different roles. The idea is you've got a project team coming together to do a costing and they're basically putting in bids for how much of their staff time or how much of their resource they would want to have in order to go into this project and to then have a discussion about whether that was the right or wrong decision. Um, and so the, it was the responsibility of the chair. We asked each of the, we asked the apprentices to take it in turns to act, to act as chairs for these these meetings, um, to actually deal with um, the, 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 that that discussion and to come to a conclusion. Um, and uh, it actually worked very well as, as as an exercise because we did encounter sort of disagreements. There are people who had fundamentally different views. How how, how we need to cut the cost of this project? Where do we cut? Um, and that was a you know very much a very real real world example um, of how how the, the, these sort of meetings might go, and it was done in an amicable and open way as you, as you would hope, and that they were actually much better at sharing than we expected them to be. Um, so that was the, that, that was an example of what we've done to basically try and make sure that the the the, the, the way that we taught, teach the program is as grounded in real world world professional practice as it possibly can be. Um, so, so in terms of the impact of that, making those change, that, that make, making that, that method of, of delivery, we say, okay, well, most, in fact, I don't think any of them had actually chaired a meeting before, and now they all have, and they're all quite happy to do it. Um, they've all learned how to deal with conflict, um, so that if they are in any future discussions, then they, they will know what they, what, you know, what effective ways of, 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 of handling that. And they enjoyed the process, which, I mean, if you, if you said it was role playing, they, they would they would run a mile or um, certainly I would, um, but they actually really enjoyed it um, and it changed their behavior at work. And we've had feedback from the employers saying they're actually much more um, lively and, and um, uh, effective within work meetings since. So we're doing something right. OK, um, and uh, I think I'm just about on, on time, but uh, just to say that, yes, so we're currently recruiting for our next cohort for, for January 2023. If this sounds exciting to you, then talk to your employer um, and uh, we will see if we can we can get this um, on board for, for them. Um, and if anyone uh, wants to contact me, then I'm not hard to find, but uh, there's my email address is there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I'm just out on time. So, uh, thanks, Anna. Thank you very much, Martin, for that. Um, I have a couple of questions. Well, a comment, really, and, and uh, a question that's coming through the chat. And firstly, uh, Kevin had a comment that was that this doesn't really apply, uh, apply to self-employed um, archaeologists, though most specialists are self-employed. Um, and the other was from Stephanie, who's just graduated with um, an MSc in Bioarchaeology and Forensic Anthropology, and is, is really looking for some field training in, in her field um, and asks, is this the right thing to do to go on this, this further um, specialist apprenticeship or is there another route? And I guess one of the things we could ask is for anyone here who has any ideas to type them into the chat so that everyone can see that. But yeah. I wondered, Martin, if you had any comments yeah, on either sure. of those two. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, Sorry, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know if you can see so I, I dragged that across. Um, yeah, okay, so start off with Kevin's point. Yeah, no, you're quite right that yes, this 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 program is, or the, the apprenticeship program, as in the, um, the subsidized program through 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 uh, for, for employers in England, it doesn't apply to self-employed people. Um, uh, the uh, that yes, you, it does have to be an employer who um, uh, people do have to be employed. And I know that that you know that that's um, uh, that is an issue. Uh, it could be that if, if there were people who were affiliated to a university, then the university could send them uh, on, on the apprenticeship. Um, uh, so that's, you know, there, 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 are, there are ways around it. If they are completely um, sort of sole traders, then they're, they're, not, they're, they're not eligible under the programme. So that is, that is an issue. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, it's not a magic wand. Uh, I mean, if if there are any individual specialists who, who who like the set like the sound of the course, you can actually do it as just as the MA um, rather than an apprenticeship. Um, but it's um, uh, so you'd have to pay the cost themselves. Um, so yeah, 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 yeah. That that's the uh, it's an inevitable part of being part of the apprenticeship. Pro the apprenticeship, uh, the whole levy program and so on is all all around employees. Um, that there is no. Uh, 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 there's no option given for uh, for self-employed people. Um, in terms of Steph's question, I think um, I think the key thing is yeah finding finding a role where you can develop those skills. I think that that it it, it is the role you need, not 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 the training. From the sound of it, I mean, I would assume that you'd be be perfectly able to um, uh, to. Uh, to sort of get up and running with um with that specialist knowledge in in, in your back pocket um but it's a question of where 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 best within within the the, the archaeological um uh employment where where, where you might, might be able to find a role like that um and i would say that certainly at the moment that there seems to be limited scope for that within universities so i mean it would have to be a large employer uh, i don't know one based in London or Southwest England or middle of England are going to be dealing with bioarchaeology all the time. Um, and if they haven't already got um, sort of dedicated people who's, who, who, who deal with that material for them, um, then, uh, then, then they perhaps they ought to have. Um, so I, I would, I would approach, I would approach those directly and say, well, um, you know, if, you know, could you create a role for me? As a um, as a as that sort of uh, 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 a, spe a specialist or a trainee specialist in that in that um, whether you'd actually be, I'm saying uh, whether whether the apprenticeship would be helpful as well um, I don't know but to say the key thing that there would be the role um, okay and I see see there's a question with from Perry there about accrediting others 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 um, the 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 program as current as it currently stands is available. Um, well, so if anyone can deliver the standard, or any university sorry, it has to be universities have to be, to deliver the standard. Um, that the, it's up to an a university whether it wanted to um, franchise that out to FE colleges um, to to deliver. Um, so that there is a mechanism there that could that it could work. Um, but if you did want to pursue that, then. Um, then it would be up, up to the FE College to find an, a, 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 a university that wanted to do that. Um, my, our experience from, from our point of view is that we have, um, there's no, no denying, we haven't been deluged with applications um, and we, it is quite a niche area. So uh, I think it, we would rather have people coming straight to us rather than um, uh, going to franchise provision, but um, that's... Um, <laughs> um, Thank you, Martin. Uh, if it might happen down the road, I guess. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, 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 I would be nice. If, I, yeah. I think there, there, there is the potential there. Certainly, if you think about the number of people who are project officers in British archaeology, I don't know how many it is, but it must be several hundred. Um, and we know categorically that almost none of those have had any significant training in project management, um, and the and in the sort of things that's covered by the apprenticeship. So I would say that if if that pool of people. Um, is the potential market, then we could theoretically have lots of different providers delivering that. Um, and that, uh, and, and so that I think that there is definitely scope there. Um, but certainly at the moment, you know, I think people, it's, it's taking a while for employers to realise yes. um, how useful this might be for them. But watch this space, I think, is it? So um, in an attempt to, to keep to time, um, we're going to move on to our next speaker. And that's Kevin Waldridge. And he has a, the interesting title of old folk using LIDAR, GIS and archaeology to research the heritage of their community and beyond. So Kevin, would you like to share your screen and, and introduce uh, yourself? Um, yeah, thanks. Okay, um, is that showing? Hello? It is, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Just a second, thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation to speak today. Um, I want to talk about a, a community project I, I'm involved in in uh, my local district. Um, it isn't strictly speaking an archaeology project, but it does involve archaeological data uh, methods and techniques. 
um, uh, applied uh, by history and, and genealogy um, interest groups. Um, our group members are largely retired, uh, but not exclusively so. Uh, my paper title is a play on the question that parts of the media suggest uh, mature participants are normally most concerned with. Um, our answer is that, of course, in reality, maturity and experience often poses questions of, of greater and wider interest. Um, my main interest as a professional archaeologist, freelance archaeologist, is providing training to the community group, and in doing so, opening their eyes to the potentials of forms of data analysis that they might not have previously encountered. Um, so I'll describe our project progress to date, and then at the end, sum up what I consider to be the benefits of acquainting uh, our community group with, with aspects of, of archaeological uh, methodology. Uh, okay, um, so um, this kind of started really uh, during the, um, the COVID lockdown, I became involved with the archaeologists on furlough. Uh, project, uh, researching uh, a series of archaeological aims utilising largely online and freely available digital resources. Um, not only was that project successful in, in achieving what I consider to be important uh, research objectives, uh, but it also brought together a disparate group of researchers sharing our experiences and learning from each other. And uh, following the return to uh, COVID normality, if such a thing exists, uh, I wonder whether the example of archaeologists on furlough um, could be extended to, uh, to a community group. Um, so I was, I was loosely involved uh, with, uh, with a University of the Third Age, a U3A local history group in my area uh, that also has links to, to the local museum. Um, and after an initial approach, uh, it transpired that several members of the group were interested in studying the local landscape as well as the more conventional local history sources. Um, this suggested that um, teaching some basic archaeological skills to a group might enhance their research potential. Um, so this, um, this chat is going to discuss how the project is proceeding to date, um, some of the benefits as well as the pitfalls of creating such a project at a community volunteer level, and suggesting um, where we think uh, this research might uh, lead in future. Sorry, wrong way. Right, okay, so um, tools and data. Um, uh, initially, we identified that, that what we wanted as far as possible was, uh, was data which was free, uh, that we didn't have to either subscribe to a particular source or, or, or that it was uh, very difficult to, to actually um, download. Uh, so, so um, you know, a combination of, 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 uh, of free and, and easier available, really. So um, the first thing we chose was, was that we would actually use um, QGIS. Uh, for those of you unaware, this is a, a GIS program. Uh, it's been going, to my knowledge, for at least 20 years. Uh, it's free at the, at the source of download. Uh, it's largely developed uh, and has developed by uh, users creating apps. Um, and, and obviously uh, that has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the biggest one, the biggest advantage, I think, to most QGIS users is that it still remains free. You don't have to subscribe to any extra um, sort of uh, parts of, of QGIS to use it. Uh, and Relatively speaking, it, it's quite easy to, to kind of use and understand um, and, and obviously train. And, and quite a few commercial archaeological units are using QGIS now. Um, and, and again, um, obviously, somebody has taken the decision that, that it's, uh, it's appropriate for, for their needs. Um, the second thing that uh, we got involved with was um, actually discovering the historic environment record for our area, which, which is Suffolk. Um, uh, again, uh, this is a resource which, um, if you went to the uh, records office in, in Bury, you'd probably be expected to pay for, but uh, we managed to get our data through the Archaeological Data Service and the, and the National Records, so basically we, we've downloaded that ourselves and, and a bit more about what we've done with that um, uh, as we go on. Uh, the third thing was to use the Ordnance Survey um, 
open source uh, mapping. Uh, so uh, it doesn't give us the absolute uh, highest degree of survey maps, but it gives us maps uh, which are suitable for our purposes uh, and also um, to the scale which, which we require for, for both our, our local area and also for, for the county as a whole. Uh, and then the fourth thing was uh, LIDAR. Uh, we've been uh, obtaining um, LIDAR images. Uh, this is through the DEFRA um, website. Um, I think it used to be the Environment Agency, but now it's uh, housed on DEFRA. And, uh, and again, uh, completely free uh, to download and, uh, and no restrictions uh, on use. Uh, it's not absolutely everything that we'd want from LIDAR, but uh, it, it's good enough for our purposes and, and probably it's also the source that is used by, I would imagine, most commercial companies in the UK who are using LIDAR. Uh, and then finally, um, using Google Earth, again, um, a free application, um, particularly useful for um, aerial uh, photography and, and for kind of locating a particular location. So a combination of, of lots of different sources, um, some of which our volunteers had heard of before, uh, obviously Ordnance Survey being, uh, being the most popular, uh, but many hadn't come across um, the freely available uh, sources of, of the LIDAR, for example, and the HER, and, and certainly very few of them had actually used uh, a GIS system, be it QGIS or, or anything else. So um, beginning with LIDAR, um, we went from the basic DEFRA data, uh, as shown here in, in raw data, um, and then um, enhancing the image um, utilizing, for example, the hillshade function in, in our QGIS. So, um, you know, that turns this sort of uh, basically almost like a negative image into, into slightly more positives. And obviously, uh, we can uh, train people to zoom into this. And, and then we went from, uh, from uh, again, this kind of gray and white, uh, but sort of enhanced image into using um, sort of uh, full uh, color rendering. Um, the project began by looking at individual one kilometer square LIDAR tiles. And then we quickly moved on um, to look at a LIDAR, uh, a larger area. Um, and this uh, we called our uh, Bly Valley uh, project. Uh, if any of you kind of, uh, uh, know the, the Suffolk area. There's obviously um, Southwold, um, Chelsea on Sea uh, to many of our local people. Um, Halesworth is uh, is just about here, lowest dock bit further up the map, um, Ipswich even further down the bottom here. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I think within this particular study area, there was something like um, 12, uh, 13, maybe uh, LIDAR, tile, one kilometer square LIDAR tiles. Um, so we started, as I said, one looking at them individually, but then looking at them on a on a, on a sort of a, a larger a map basis. Uh, the team were particularly taken uh, with this final image, as, as it clearly showed the extent and depth of the Bly Valley floodplain and how much land had been reclaimed over the past um, four millennia. Uh, showing, for example, the modern town of, of Southwold, uh, once upon a time was an island, uh, and, and using uh, an approximate guess at uh, sea levels, which we could adjust in, in our map, uh, we were able to kind of basically create uh, what we thought were sort of landmass maps for, for the Bronze Age, uh, the late Iron Age, the Roman period, uh, right through to, to the medieval period. Um, so, um, yeah, looking at, at uh, you know, how the land had, had developed and, and then, then particularly applying that to, to the use of um, the HER data. So uh, this is the uh, a part of the uh, Suffolk uh, historic environment record. Uh, Suffolk is, is a very rich county in terms of archaeology, so there are thousands and thousands of entries. Uh, what we did was basically to um, decide that we only really wanted to look at the prehistory and the Roman periods, which um, you know, maybe cut the uh, HER by at least a third, maybe slightly more. Um, and then basically we wanted to find some way that we could actually uh, register, log in these, uh, these records on, onto, onto a map. So, um, you know, the, the Suffolk HER record, like most, does contain information about the, uh, the coordinates of, of each particular um, 
uh, entry, although sometimes these uh, coordinates are kind of hidden away in text. So one of the first things that we did was to uh, bring this text out and basically to highlight it in, in what we call it, uh, X and Y columns, basically Northings and East, Eastings and Northings. Uh, and then using this information, we could actually uh, put this into QGIS, which has a very, very simple program of uh, once recognizing uh, coordinates, it will actually draw you a map. Uh, so uh, this is uh, our little map of uh, all of the uh, relevant uh, HER uh, entries for our specific area. And as you see, we, we've uh, just, on this particular map, we just color coded these to, to make them easy to see. And obviously we can, uh, we can turn on and turn off um, the different layers um, as we go along. Um, so as merely a database, the HDR has its uses, uh, but once the OS coordinates are captured, the data is converted um, from an Excel data file into points on a map, uh, it gains an extra significance. The team have been looking at these dates of these finds and comparing their land location to the landscape uh, as derived from, from, from the LIDAR. Uh, so for example, you know, uh, knowing uh, where, where was wet and dry land during certain periods, uh, we can then look at the particular finds and as it happens, you know, most of the prehistoric finds happen to uh, turn up on, 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 on the edges, uh, the sort of the edges of, of, of the floodplain. Uh, particularly along the River Bly. Uh, some of the Roman ones are, are kind of uh, what appear to be more in, in, in the water, but clearly uh, the, either the sea level has, has uh, decreased or, or the land has been infilled uh, at that time. So it kind of gives us a, a basic um, uh, idea of what to look at. Um, and then the latest stage of, 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 the, of the analysis is to looking at to how uh, this applies to, uh, to the OS map. So effectively uh, teaching uh, volunteers how to uh, do a map regression exercises using, uh, using um, GIS. So um, what, what we've done is we, we produced our own guide in the first instance of how to georeference maps, aerial photographs and plan images. Uh, as I say, the, the main source of data is, is from uh, the OS Open Data, uh, aerial photos from Google Earth, and, and then following our easy to use guide, basically people can, um, can uh, sort of georeference this data and look at it in, in, in sort of true map uh, location. Uh, we also um, use um, the uh, National Library of Scotland um, old OS map data in this, so we can go back uh, at different scales uh, certainly to the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, and then uh, also where they exist, um, tithe maps and, and uh, some of the earlier surveys of, of, um, of Suffolk, uh, even from the, the 17th and 18th century. Uh, obviously, uh, bearing in mind the, the, uh, the limits on, on, on the survey reliability and scale for those um, sort of maps. Uh, so um, what we've done, um, uh, without going into far too much detail, is we've identified a number of projects. So these have all come from, from the folk engaged either in the, the genealogy group or from the local history group. Uh, and, and there's various things they want to look at. So, for example, the Chester Street uh, is, is the older street in Halesworth. It, it's got probably something in the region of 80 dwellings uh, dating from the uh, late 15th century through to the modern day. And, and one group of people is interested in, in finding out from both uh, current residents and also looking at records of older residents as to what was going on in these houses, how the houses have changed over time. Uh, and we're basically providing a GIS back, backup of, of templates of, of street plans at different dates uh, using the information available to us. Uh, the Walpole Old Chapel project is, is a pure uh, genealogy project where uh, we've been looking at uh, the burial records, but also then the location of, of graves within the, within the uh, small cemetery attached to the chapel. Uh, and obviously over the years, some of these graves, uh, the gravestones have become uh, sort of illegible or fallen over. So, so we've managed to kind of plot the location of, of graves and then tie them in as far as we can to, to the records of, of who we know to be buried there at certain dates. And then taking that on further, we're then looking at the relatives of these people uh, with a view to actually trying to engage some of the local people within the area as to you know, their ancestors' uh, connections with, with the chapel. 
Um, our Roman Road project is looking at uh, the road between Halesworth and Bungie, uh, identified by Margaret as, as a Roman road. Uh, we're not so much interested in the road, it, it's still there, it's pretty straight, uh, but we are interested in, in one, obviously where it crosses the river wave near Bungie, uh, probably not. Uh, the location where the road currently ends, uh, and also uh, any uh, roadside dwellings, uh, monuments uh, along the length of the road. Again, using LIDAR to look at this. Um, Rumbra Church is a, a similar uh, project. Uh, we have um, a moated uh, 12th, 13th century church, and we are looking at the LIDAR to see whether there's more information in the surrounding fields as to what's going on there. Um, so yeah, so a, a whole uh, list of, of projects. And again, because we're only a voluntary group, there's no timetable for us to necessarily finish any of these. Uh, and, and we can add other projects as even individuals rather than groups want to look at them, uh, just to kind of, you know, help each other out with, with using the GIS and, and, and applying the, the, the data that we can to, to their needs. So um, we come to outcomes. Um, I won't go take very long over this. Uh, but, you know, I have been thinking that what, what's, what's been the point of, of trying to achieve this exercise and, and, and where, 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 do we get, um, where do we get to? Uh, so the first thing is that um, I mentioned this at the beginning, but we are engaging an interested older audience. Um, uh, of course, uh, we, we, we didn't necessarily want to go for the older audience. That just happens to be what they are. Uh, we're not entirely all retired. Uh, many of us have time on our hands and, and you know, the kind of the local interest, uh, particularly affiliated to the U3A, um, uh, takes people uh, into our kind of uh, ambit. Uh, and, and then uh, once we get them interested, uh, it's interested um, how quickly and, and how sort of uh, enmeshed do they become. Uh, it's, like, it's obviously intellectually stimulating, again, uh, something which is... Uh, recommended for us as we all get a bit older, uh, you know, just, just to keep your mind ticking over. And when you get bored with just doing the Sudoku in the morning. Um, it's locally based, uh, which we think is quite important. We, we, we want to, you know, obviously pull people into to a centre, the Halesworth Museum when we need to, but, you know, we, we want people from the whole district to, to feel involved, but we don't necessarily want people to think that, you know, we're, we're going to be going off and, and start looking at a project in Cambridgeshire or Lincolnshire or something like that. So uh, locally based, linked to the local museum and then obviously linked to the, the local archive sources that we have. Uh, both in the district and in the county. Uh, it is largely desk based. Again, you know, uh, my experience from the archaeologists on furlough project was that this does work. Um, we utilize that, you know, free resources when we can get hold of them. But we also have um, team meetings online again, which, which, you know, we kind of learned from, from, from uh, the archaeologists on furlough, uh, you know, they can be very effective. And, and, and once people kind of get used to it, I think, you know, they, they, they're happy to join in. There is a, you know, a sort of a, a, an initiation, I guess, when we might come along to two of these and not say anything, but, but you know, we, we, we hope by, by the third that you, you might be willing to kind of add your view. Uh, there's uh, familiarizing the audience with, with GIS LIDAR and, and data, uh, as I explained. Uh, many of them, uh, even if they late in their careers, if they're retired, they did start to work with computers. Few of them got into doing sort of data analysis. So uh, that's a, a joy. Uh, and, uh, you know, despite what many people out there think, I, I, we haven't encountered yet a, a sort of, you know, uh, technophobia to, to the extent that, um, you know, people feel that they can't engage at, at all. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we do try to ease people into it. And, and we do, you know, uh, point out that, that um, you know, uh, making errors isn't a problem. We, we, we always, you know, uh, preserve the, the original data. So if something totally goes wrong, that we can still go back and, and, and recreate the point that it got to. Uh, and, and obviously utilizing the GIS techniques, uh, LIDAR analysis, georeferencing, heat spots, low cost routes, et cetera. Uh, this is our next step in the GIS. We want to kind of show people some of the other processes. And, you know, it's, it's many of the processes actually that, um, you know, commercial archaeology doesn't even go to, not in a great de deal of, of detail. So, uh, you know, we, we are kind of advancing knowledge and, and, and also, um, you know, spreading it. Um, and then there's the applying learn techniques for general citizen science. As I said, this is not strictly an archaeology project. We are using archaeological data and, and tools to, to kind of uh, help people with local history, genealogy, 
and, and, uh, and, muse and museum uh, purposes. And finally, it is good fun. And um, I think when it comes down to it, that's why most of our people have stayed with us now for just about a year and, and why they come back and hopefully uh, how we can um, engage um, new uh, participants in future. Uh, so that's it from me. I'll switch this off. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was that was really interesting and actually very positive. And um, like you, I, I don't often find an old deal audience who who were as, as scared of IT as we're led to believe. I find um, they're, they're pretty able. And and also it's been proven that if you learn new skills, it does help to keep your, your brain and your outlook young. So we've got a, a question from Edith in, in the chat. She says, is your guide to georeferencing in QGIS available to use by other groups elsewhere in the country? I'm going to be working with a group researching the landscape of resources, transport links, et cetera, of historic ironworks. Uh, yes, and um, uh, if, um, if uh, at the end uh, Edith gets in touch with me, uh, I can send a, a copy of it. And also, um, you know, we have a couple of exercises involved. So um, I, I can send her the data that's involved and she can do that. Um, I should also point out that there is a, a, a guide available through Badger in their resources to uh, QGIS in general, which, uh, you know, um, as I say, goes into greater detail with some of the other processes, not just georeferencing. And um, we do also, uh, we have in preparation guides to, um, you know, how to uh, use hotspots in GIS and, and how to do least cost routes. So, yeah, again, uh, down the line, um, we'll make this available. I, I, I probably will talk to to Connolly and see if I can post them on, on the uh, Badger resources, because then they'll be available for anyone to just download at their, uh, at their leisure. Yeah. But uh, in Edith's case, I'll, I'll definitely send you the backup data as well if you leave me an address. Thank you. I've got a comment from, from Perry in the chat, um, congratulating you on your project and, and mentioning some, uh, some other projects, uh, Altogether Archaeology, um, who've been using LIDAR uh, study for the landscapes in the North Pennines. I'll leave everybody to read that um, so that we, we can keep to time. Um, but thank you very much, Kevin. That was, that was really interesting. So next, um, we're going to move on to um, Rich Osgood and Dickie Bennett. And I think many of you will have heard them speak before. They're going to talk about uh, mending wounds, archaeology as recovery for military communities. So welcome, Rich and Dickie. Thank you. Right. I'll try and get my screen shared and see if you can uh, see it and give me a give me a shout as and when the the show comes up properly. Is that working? It is, yeah. Brilliant. Um, very opposite, Anna, having us along today, because I'm sure you're all aware, it's uh, World, World Mental Health Awareness Day. And so this is uh, part of our elements with this. So what I'm going to do is I'll show you some of the project elements we've been working on um, on the military estate um, and, and sorts of aspects we've been able to utilize that the military already has. And then I'm gonna hand over to, to Dickie so he can tell you about the efficacy of this. And it's not just um, us saying that it's, it's a good thing. Hopefully we can empirically show it's um, the case. Um, Kevin's talk was, was really interesting. I think having fun is, is a really key thing, really important. And um, what we also want for our team is to be able to keep this work going over the, the darker, colder months. So it isn't just digging, it is doing all those research, good research things that they can feed into to future projects. You're probably aware the MOD has got a lot of resources. It's out there training over vast tracts of land all over the uh, all throughout the year it's got about one percent of the uk mainland it's got some overseas estates as well but we're uh, particularly focusing on the uk and lots of different nationalities training here and the resources that it's able to deploy are fundamentally as, as you'd expect for military training but they can have an archaeological benefit too and we're hoping to bring those sorts of things in um, in the work we do with with our veterans the image you can see here is one of our, our manned aerial vehicles, the UAVs. This is the Watchkeeper, and it flies out of Boscombe Down in Wiltshire, over Salisbury Plain. 
and it will take lots and lots of reconnaissance photographs to bring into mapping cells and to pick up intelligence for military training. But at the same time, you can use it for archaeology. We have had uh, this particular piece of kit operated by the artillery taking some imagery of one of our Bronze Age sites on the plane that we used to build our Bronze Age roundhouse at Putzer, um, which is uh, something we completed exactly a year ago today. But they also give you good excavation photographs. This fact is a different drone photograph from one of our training safety marshals. All the guys that make sure that the training areas are a safe place to train have these drones to make sure that people don't accidentally or indeed deliberately go into live firing areas. They can patrol the area. They can stop petty crime with them or chase petty criminals. But they can also take air photographs. This is our um, 7th century cemetery site at a place called Avon Camp on Salisbury Plain. You can see the central ring ditch with a burial located in the middle. And then to the right, as you're looking at it, the, the, the zebra crossing effect of a series of um, 7th century burials. So really effective photography. Of course, it's on chalk, so it makes it a lot easier. This photograph was actually used in Antiquity magazine at the end of it, but taken by a serving Sergeant Major uh, using his security kit. Again, the military have mapping cells, and as we've just heard from Kevin, mapping mapping is a really key thing and a really useful resource. Well, the military have their own mapping teams within groups like the Royal Engineers, and they're able to provide different data sets for us to use within our archaeology, so that's no cost to our team, but a, a really useful element for us. This is uh, well, Burrow Island, as you can see the map on the right, or colloquially known as Rat Island, and taken by a Royal Engineer survey team. What they've done for us is provide us this mapping because uh, there are a series of burials that are eroding out of the cliffside in this little island by the naval base at Portsmouth. These are all convicts, we think, from the Georgian period. They're radiocarbon dated to the later 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, and that's a resource we can bring to bear, along with this thing. If you've ever seen Apocalypse Now, I think of the, the boats going down the Mekong Delta. This is a combat support boat um, that Port Maritime Regiment, based at, uh, near, near Southampton at Marchwood, are able to get to us so that we can get off the island if the tides need us to, or we need to make a quick exit for a health and safety point of view. But it's a resource we're able to use for free. Very, very fortunate. Within the military as well, the military police have a forensics team a, um, based at Southwark Park, again nearby Portsmouth, part of the Special Operations Group. And what we wanted to do with them is work with our veterans and the serving soldiers to provide them with a training experience at um, much less cost to the, uh, the ministry, which will be also disassociated from some of the traumatic elements they're going to have to deal with in theatre. So they came down um, to Rat Island, and you can see uh, one of our um, NCOs here dealing with one of the, the skulls that's eroding from on the convict grave. So they're getting a training benefit. We're getting a labor team and also their, their military. So they're able to help out with some of our veterans. Um, then they take the remains up to, to Southwark Park, the forensic center there, uh, and are learning from um, forensic anthropologists and specialists about the various ailments that these individuals have gone through and doing the usual things of sexing the skeletons, aging them, all those sorts of things. Survey is nothing new to the military. I suppose, um, as you saw from uh, from talks earlier, ordnance survey is a bit of a key, the ordnance bit of it. Um, but lots of the old techniques that, that Phil Andrews here in the, in the White Hat on the right from Wessex Archaeology are able to train up some of the more modern um, uh, soldiers to, to how we use dumpy levels because it's an easy piece of kit you don't need to be technical specialists although we have had some of these guys then move on to the engineer survey departments using um, more advanced technologies um, ranging from the uh, differential gps machines through to um, uh, just uh, the, the 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 other range finding pieces of equipment um, that the military use but it's a, it's a good starter for them good training for some of our vets you may also be aware that the military has an undertaking to protect cultural property when it deploys. We signed the Hague Convention for Protection of Cultural Property Overseas. There's a group within the army to go and enforce this and make sure that people are trained. Well, we're able to get these guys onto archaeological excavations and they're able to learn about archaeology on the estate and bring those into play. And we're able to incorporate archaeological monuments into their training packages so that it's a key component for military training units coming through to respect heritage and they'll do that overseas as well it's also got the best badge in the british army i think you know, the gorgon's head really really quite an impressive image we've also tried to um 
bring in our field work to, to influence some of the guidance documents as to how archaeology could be done. This is um, an image taken um, it's about almost, oh my gosh, almost 10 years ago now of an excavation of a spitfire done under the Protection of Military Remains Act. And we provided guidance notes, uh, work by the vets on this Spitfire P9503 flown by Port, uh, pilot, Abbott, uh, pilot Paul, Paul Bailey on in, uh, in the Battle of Britain, which crashed near Andover um, on the plane. And um, we wanted to provide guidance to applicants as to how you could do this sort of field work archaeologically rather than just with the JCB and record it without it being hugely onerous and you'll provide um, a great deal more data from it. You can see the, the chalk impact of the Spitfire as it hit rather neatly. Um, if you put an overlay of a Spitfire on it, Mark 1 Spitfire, it fits, it fits rather beautifully. So that's pretty much how the, how the aircraft hit the ground and uh, we found a lot of the components within that. So the guidance notes were then adopted by Historic England. You can find them online. So anyone who wants to do one of these things in, in a fashion that will get them a permission from the Joint Casualty Centre, which is what you need, uh, we, we encourage them to use these documents. The work with the veterans, um, it, it provides a, a really unusual juxtapositions and challenges. This is a, a British uh, officer from the Royal Engineers and he's excavating, you can see in the foreground, a boot. Uh, you just see the, the thing that looks like a horseshoe at the bottom is the, the boot plate on the bottom of the boot. Well, actually within this boot, there was a foot. And we declared this, this is in France, declared this to the Commonwealth War Graves who told us that um, this would get a war grave and get a headstone, but it wouldn't be um, a grave of an unknown soldier because this individual might have survived losing their foot. So it'll be what's called a scant remains grave. We were able to show them that the individual that did the excavation here was fully aware of that because he only has one foot and indeed one eye after his encounter with, with an uh, explosive device. So that's a sort of curiosity that some of our, our work with the veterans provides. And in fact, it was this chap really actually wanted to do this field work. He wanted to um, excavate that particular set of remains because he could empathize in a way that I would imagine pretty much very well very few archaeologists had had that sort of connection to this sort of material and we always make sure that the guys are able to set their own parameters on site they um, will work out what they're capable of doing we make sure that the ramps are cut down into the site so that's our sort of uh, real um, signature i suppose on, on our field but that uh, the site will have a ramp that it enables more accessibility no matter how shallow the edges of the trenches are so you see me showing some current artillerymen the um, the excavation we're doing at Dunch Hill whilst uh, member of the household cavalry a veteran excavates some post holes and we found that um one of the key things for these guys is, is camping actually sitting around around a fire talking the tales discussing um, what's happened with them in the past what they're hoping to do in the future is a really positive thing and so although hotels are altogether maybe more comfortable and comforting in fact sitting around bonding one another as you do on lots of excavations um, is a really key thing um, we've been able to put them together this is relatively socially distanced you can see about two meters between them all working out how uh, how the post holes went at dunch hill to provide our roundhouse and i've talked about incongruous well-being um, this is one of our, our well-being officers who's, who's working with us and he was uh, no archaeological experience at all and he came along to inspect for the army's point of view as to how this sort of project might work whether indeed it did work from his his point of view and he was immediately phoning his his officers saying you've got to get more people onto this because it may seem incredibly strange that you're providing catharsis by working with human remains and this is on a, on a seventh century burial um, at haven camp but he could witness just in the short time that he was with us a couple of weeks, the, the improvement in the well-being of the, of the teams out there. We're also able to bring this work through the Army Diversity Networks. So the LGBTQ plus um, Army teams through the Sikh network, the Muslim network. Um, and I think what we really need to do in archaeology is improve diversity. It's a, it's a key driver. And um, this is something that our excavation work, the Army being as diverse as it, as it is, is able to, I hope, play a part in. And also we work with, with overseas people. Um, you've got a British uh, soldier on the left. He's working with two Polish individuals as part of a, a project to excavate a Battle of Britain Spitfire flown by one of the pilots on 303 Squadron, which is a Polish squadron, most successful one in the Battle of Britain. And these individuals came over and worked um, as a team. But we work with French veterans, with Australians, with Americans, with Germans. 
and it's something we're, we're really, really keen on. Um, humans being the very strange species that we are, sadly, there will, I think, always be the, the need for working with other nationalities because we'll always be um, fighting at some place on the globe. It's a doomy, doomy impression, maybe, but maybe current events are bearing that out. And we can also make this a sort of a, a cross-generational thing, I think. You're not just looking at um, older people. Youngsters are really key, really important. Bringing the army families on on board has been really, really good. Some of the people that take part, the the older participants, like to do so with either their spouse or their partner, or, or with their with their children, even with them. And we can always find ways and means of of doing this. Also, there are huge communities um, from a military perspective that don't necessarily get to experience their their landscape in which they're sighted for three or four years before they move on in a, in a way that involves heritage and I'm keen that we do that as much as possible so these are these are children based at Lark Hill actually in the World Heritage Area of Stonehenge they're looking at the remains of a horse hospital and they are working away these are all military kids uh, working away to try and see where the horse hospital was in the First World War and they're combining that with the study of Michael Morpurgo's book War Horse um, and trying to bring as many cross-curricular elements together, but getting them to appreciate the landscape in which their uh, their mums and dads are, are training in all the time. And you can bring ethos into that. This is a thing where you can look at the, the military side of things and get their, their own narrative, their own stories in. Uh, I put PWRR, that's the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment group that the Hampshires used to be, the Hampshire Regiment. This is a site in near Winchester. This is a Hessian camp. Um, that was there in the in the early 18th century when the um, the Brits were using Hessian mercenary troops. Think of the film Sleepy Hollow. Uh, the headless horseman was a was a Hessian soldier. Uh, we used them to defend Britain and then in the the wars against the Americans. But it was also where the Hampshire Regiment lived in the cold fields of Winchester over a period of time. And these uh, individuals here, they are soldiers that were in that regiment or the the successor elements of that regiment, excavating their own history. And that's a really strong connection. Um, all the, the guys you see here went on to do degrees at Winchester University in archaeology. Another connection um, to ethos, this is Pete, who's from the Royal Tank Regiment, excavating the track of a Mark II tank over at Bullecourt in France. Um, perfect for his ethos, but also for his recovery. Um, when we lifted that tank track on the left, we found the remains of, of a couple of German soldiers underneath it, which triggered quite a negative response in him to start with because he associated it with um, what was happen happened to him in operational theatres. So um, he had a, um, a PTSD episode, but fortunately we had the team together that could, could deal with those challenges because we expected it might well happen. Um, he was grounded, he was brought back, and by the end he wanted to complete the excavation. And he spoke to these individuals as if um, they were his tank crew that he never got to say goodbye to. We were told, to, told by the... Um, the medic that was working with us. In fact, it's it's sometimes good not to avoid your um, your demons, but to face them. And for Pete, um, it was actually quite a positive experience out of what could have been quite dramatic things at the time. And people make finds. Um, we all like um, discovering thing that human curiosity. Kenny here on the right, member of the fifth battalion of the rifles, who told us that he was concentrating so hard on the burial that he's excavating here, that um, he was sleeping for the first time properly post-Afghanistan. Um, he's now just completed his 10th year um, as a professional field archaeologist and you can see this bucket that he's working on is a rather splendid 7th, uh, 6th century vessel with stems of yew, with the original stems of yew held by bands of bronze, with the repoussé decoration, probably one of the most intact to these little drinking vessels from that period in Britain. And if you go to the British Museum, if you go to the early medieval galleries, and you look at the uh, the Sutton New Helmet, and if you were imagining you are the face of Radwald, look out to your right, you will see this sign, and it says, the man buried with a small bucket and a spear from the Anglo-Saxon Cemetery at Barrow Clump in Wiltshire, copyright Wessex Archaeology, burial excavated by Rifleman Rowan Kendrick of five rifles. So he has his name in the British Museum. And if you've ever experienced this wonderful series, Detectorists, uh, it's a thing that Lance has with great pride. He goes to see the Astle that he's found in the BM. It's something that very few of us will have. Um, real source of pride for Kenny. Other individuals, again, setting their own parameters. Tyler's another 
uh, amazing uh, imparter of morale on sites because he's absolutely indomitable. And if it's raining on site, and you've got some people complaining a little bit and they'll see Tyler working um, when it tends to put things into perspective. It also means that you, you can't always tell people off for sitting on a section when you can see their legs sitting on the section on the left, but they're not actually there. They've just taken the legs off because they're more comfortable to excavate. And again, it's back to that story of people setting their own parameters of what they're able to do themselves. We've looked at apprenticeships. Martin mentioned apprenticeships. That's a really interesting um, thing. It's something we're hopefully examining in the future within MOD of getting some of these together. But some of our, our guys, as I mentioned, go on to do degrees. The chap you see um, excavating um, a grave on the right, he was a veteran of HMS Glamorgan in the Falklands War, which is one of those vessels that was hit with the Exocet missiles. He's recently um, joined our, our program and he's now doing his degree at the University of Bradford, just finished his first year. And he's found this really rather splendid um, seventh century copper alloy disc with a child burial. It's one, one object, but very different views of it. It's a disc which has these four perforations, makes it almost look like a cross with this silver topping, almost like a built milk bottle top with um, twisted um, early medieval interweave design on, really fabulous find. And another of our chaps, this is John, uh, submariner on the left working with one of our volunteers Carlos to record a grave. John had had um, quite a tough time, he'd uh, not left his house in um, uh, almost a year I think it was because of his his illnesses but he's now on, on an upwards trajectory and he is um, just started his first year at Winchester University and he's um, probably got one of the most experienced undergraduates they've got I would have thought. Also he's a very good thatcher, this is him working away at Butzer putting together the the tops of the the early uh, the late Bronze Age house that we're working on and it's imparting these different skill sets and trying to get them working throughout the year not just on excavations but on broader heritage things doing the sorts of um, desktop research that Kevin was talking about and mapping and planning projects and, and researching their own neighborhoods as well as working on the excavations uh, and the field programs which we find to be really important it's key is that once you've sparked their interest is to facilitate that um, that love of heritage and archaeology to keep it going, not just to provide them with one week and then it's then it's goodbye. So they've got a really good team of, um, you know, a Facebook group where they'll, they'll chat to each other, they'll meet in uh, cafes and pubs and go out and do social events. It's a really key thing to keep them together. I'm going to finish my bit before handing over to Dickie with this, because the next issue, perfect timing, of the uh, the Archaeologist, the CIFA magazine, will have an interview with one of these vets and what he's found to be really important. So do watch this space and um, and and see what see what else uh, the, these guys have been doing. But hopefully, we've finished well over a decade of this. We'll we'll keep this this going, um, but we'd like to um, evolve. We like them to be um, either. At universities, we're getting more and more into the CIFA, so that's that's a key thing for us as well. Is that they, um, if they want to, to keep their professional elements going. Okay, I shall stop now, and I'm going to hand over to Dicky to say what is and what isn't effective. Good, Rich. Um, and I think you can see my screen now. Uh, Yep, that's fine. You got it, yeah? Yes, we can see that. Brilliant. Um, so I just want to continue really from uh, what Rich was saying, um, but I'm going to look more at the softer side of things, look at um, our understanding of, of, of the benefit of all this. So as Richard showed, um, we have that technological innovation that there is the ability to utilise the assets um, from the military um, to help the veterans themselves. Um, and I can speak from personal experience that this, this is one of the things that really helped me when I transitioned into archaeology from the military. It, it, it was that linking with the military and that, that reaffirming um, of, of my identity because I lost that very much when, when I left. Um, so one of the things that's been important for, for, um, for me with breaking on heritage is, is actually looking at that change that happened to me. Um, how, how, how did archaeology affect me uh, and my peer group and then how do we understand that change? Um, so hence why we've come up with this title is, is understanding the value in our research and also the value of understanding what it means really. Um, so archeology, span as we've seen, 
in, in all these presentations really um, can be a mechanism for positive change. Um, for, for, for Operation Nightingale, um, for the past 10 years, it's, it's been promoting that positive um, change in wellbeing. Um, it's been um, reducing um, common mental disorders like anxiety and depression. And it's been giving people um, a, a, a place to, to engage. Um, it, it created these support networks. So as Richard said previously with John and Submariner, if you've been in your house for a year and, and you've not left, you are becoming very isolated and that's not good for your mental health. So being able to engage with people again in a meaningful way and in a way which is, um, is right for you, it is really important. Um, we know that when people leave the military, sometimes they can be very anti-military for a while because they're trying to reconcile what's happening with them and it, and it happened to me so for me initially linking directly into a military community probably, probably wasn't the best thing so being able to link into veterans that had been through something very similar um w w was perfect and then this then builds on to having them linked with the professional support so people with the commercial units that we work with um so not only are you getting that sense of well-being within yourself while you're doing this, you're creating these informal um, professional networks. Um, and again, these things link into that sense of achievement. In order to feel good about ourselves, we need to make sure we're having a sense of achievement. It has to be meaningful. Um, and when we're getting the sense of achievement, we're getting that self-worth, we're building up our confidence. And this is then reigniting this, this, this desire to engage, this desire to, to get on with life again. There are some um, articles at the bottom, uh, some links there at the bottom to some research that we've done, and I'm happy to send them out afterwards if anybody wants them. So how do we know? As I've just said, uh, there's a lot of, when we first started this, there was, there was no literature about how these work, why these work. Um, so we had to find this out the hard way, really. Um, but now there, there is a lot of um, literature out there, and some of it is really, really good, and it really um, highlights what it is in these projects that work. So what, what we've been doing with Breaking on Heritage, in order to analyze and assess um, this change in, in the veterans um, on the projects. We've been using psychological scales. Um, it's important to stress now though, these scales we do use when we're on other projects with um, a non-veteran community as well. So the research that we've got does um, cover the general population and the veteran population alike, because yeah, they are slightly different. So what we'll do is we'll use the general anxiety disorder seven. Um, so that looks at scoring anxiety. We'll use WEMWEBS, which is the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, and this measures wellbeing. Uh, and we'll use a personal health questionnaire eight, which looks at measuring depression. Um, and what we do is we get the uh, participants to fill one in right at the very start of the project on the first day, and then on the last day of the project. And this, this forms um, our baseline, really. When we get them to score at the end of it, that will then give us our final point. Uh, and then we can then um, measure the change of the scores in between. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, so looking at this research, it, it, it's good to have this data. We, we, we've got these scores that we have. Um, they give us some numbers to, to firm up that is it working? Does it work? Yes. Why does it work? Because uh, this score matches up with this score and it shows us that it works. That's great. So that gives us our quantitative element. Um, but that only tells us a small part of the story. What we need to know as well is, is, is we need to understand um, why this is happening as well. And, and this is something um, which is actually proving a, little, a lot more harder um, than, than um, we think. It, it's, it's quite elusive, um, but we are starting to get some trends and I'll you, speak more about that uh, in a minute. The so the scores that we have, so using the work and the mental wellbeing skill, the WEMWEBS, um, this probably looks like gibberish to a lot of you, and it does to me, um, but the, the important parts in these are the, the numbers in bold. So the top left, what that's showing us is that um, using the analysis of variance uh, and over scale, um, what we're doing is correlating the scores of the first project and the last project of, of the participants. Um, and what we're doing is we're using this across the scale. So these participants may have done one project, three projects, five projects. What it does is it takes a mean score um, of, um, so it takes the average score from them uh, in their um, assessment. What we're looking for is we're looking for a p-value, which as you can see is highlighted, 
it's only here. It, it's highly at the top there. Uh, and what it does, it goes to the engine. It does the magic of statistics. And if we can get a p value of less than 0.5, uh, 0.05, sorry, um, we can show that this is statistically significant and um, statistically uh, valid, really. So we've shown using Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing that participants involved in these projects are getting statistically significant increases in their well-being. What it does show as well that like, there is actually there is no effect or no difference whether you are a veteran or civilian or no matter or, or the length of time of the project. So if you've been on one project, you're going to get the same uplifting well-being as you are if you've been on five projects. Um, we can see again for the general anxiety disorders. So the, the second scale at the bottom, we can see again that the P number is um, 0 0.02. So again, to have that statistically significant change, we need 0 0.05. And we can see again, we're, we're well below that. Um, so we, we have that decrease in our numbers, which shows again that um, we are getting that statistically significant change. And again, there is no um, effect in terms of um, veteran or civilian or um, longevity of a project. And I can quickly through, we've got the personal health question. Now, again, we're seeing there, we've got um, a statistically significant change of 0 .07, 0 0.007, which again shows us that we are well below where we need to be. Um, and therefore that change is statistically significant. And again, there is, there is no difference um, between type of participant and length of time on a project. So what that shows is that these projects are, um, they, they are working. There is something here that makes these projects work. And there is something in what we're doing that is creating this increase in well-being and decrease in depressive symptoms and, anxiety, and anxious symptoms. Uh, the question then is to try and figure out what this is. So this is where the qualitative research comes in. So it's looking at um, using structured questionnaires um, to speak to the participants and get their experiences, get them to reflect on, on what's happened to the projects, why their feel it's um, happened, what benefits they think they've had from it um, I, I just get that their story really um, to, as, as to what they think has gone on um, when we've done this what we can do is we can bring the, the the data that we have on the numbers and bring it together with a theme and hopefully bring it together so yes it shares the projects is working now let's see why it's working and this takes us very nicely onto onto this really so we did a thematic survey uh, a thematic analysis sorry of um the, um, the, the surveys we got back from the participants. And we, we identified three key themes here. Um, we identified the interpersonal theme. Um, so it's, it's the social aspects of the project and, and that kind of scored the highest really. So looking at um, being part of a project, being part of something, that sense of belonging, that sense of purpose, um, scored really highly on, on what affected um, people and what, what they felt was working for them. Um, looking at the Developmental, so developing new skills, improving confidence, um, reassurance of what you are able to do, and developing that passion for something again. And then finally, we, we determined the holistic personal development, so that improved mental health, the ability to talk without judgment, and again, the saving of lives there, because that's an important thing. If someone says, you know what, this is saving my life, that is actually quite a powerful thing. Um, so we've been able to start to unpick um, some of the themes of these projects that are working. Um, using these, um, you, 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 using the, the, these um, terms from the, the, the veterans themselves, um, we're able to look at what's actually gone on. We're able to look at what people are, are finding has been beneficial for them and, and try and pick out why it is beneficial. Um, again, just a few of these quotes uh, feel like being part of a family again so you've got that sense of community having a sense of achievement um something is not i've not had since i've been medically retired um i also felt useful and not a burden or totally useless these, these are all things that um most people feel in life at some point we, we, i mean we do go through times when we feel like a burden we're not we're not who we think we are um we're not as happy as we could be um but to have this um compacting when uh, your mental health as well, it, it can be quite debilitating. Again, thinking back to John, um, these are the, it's reasons like this why he didn't leave his house. Um, so to be able to unpick why these are happening and then tailor make a project which caters and facilitates all these 
um, is, is absolutely essential. And I think that's one of the strengths uh, that Operation Active Guild has. Um, it, it's been able to tailor projects for community. Um, we, we, are, we're, we are very um, lucky to have um, a community we, which we do understand, a community which has all gone through the same process uh, to make them the way they are. Uh, and understanding that process is very different. It can be very complicated when you're dealing with the general population because people have got to their particular um, endpoint through many different complicated ways. Um, so I'm not saying this is this is easy, um, but it, we we do have um, an insight into our into our population before we actually start. Um, so building on the knowledge that we've got, we, we, we understand how it works, kind of, we've got the data to show it does work. And so, so what do we need to do? It's, it, this, is, this is a time to rest on our laurels. It's a time to build on the success that we've, we have um, and strive to better understand what we're doing um, and why we're doing it. Let out that in the charge, I mean, why is this happening? Why is it doing that? What's that facilitating? What's causing that? Um, we need to, critically assess what it is that we're doing. We're using certain types of skills. Are them skills actually doing what we need them to do? Do they reflect accurately um, the well-being of, of our participants? There are several well-being skills out there. Um, and is this time now to start reevaluating the one we're using and say, okay, if we use a different well-being scale, skill, we'll we get the same results. Um, it's important to start publishing far and wide all these success stories that are coming through this heritage well-being. Um, York Archaeological Trust have done some great work. You've, you've got the work that Maud has been doing, Wessex Archaeology. You've got the um, project that um, Kevin was talking about. All these, all these projects are, are really great. And it's when we understand them and when we kind of understand the mechanisms for, for why these things are working, we need to kind of get it out and publish it, but publish it not just within the, the, the discipline of archaeology. We need to publish it wider um, so that what we're doing is reaching the people that really need it. It's reaching them, reaching them social researchers. It's hitting the medical profession. So social prescribing isn't coming up to that barrier all the time. Well, it, it, it's about really advocating what we're doing. And, and we do this through collaborating. So collaborating with different projects, collaborating with different um, disciplines, social scientists, psychologists, um, whatever it may be, just, just to make sure that we are doing um, the right thing. And that, and that is seen to be working and, and really benefiting people. And speaking of collaborations, um, innovating, all that sort of stuff, um, there is a new project about to launch, um, which is based off the Operation Nightingale model, um, it's called Operation Phoenix, which will be starting um, next month. And this is um, to help um, the Fire and Rescue Service in Northamptonshire. They're, they've got um, quite a few people are off um, on sick or struggling at work at the minute and they've taken the Northampton Fire Service have, have taken the um, decision to, to try and replicate um, Operation Nightingale for their community. Uh, this will be done with um, University of Leicester and Chester House Estates and Stanwick Lakes and it, it's not going to include an archaeological intervention it will be more um, heritage based skills and heritage craft skills so I'm um, looking at doing research workshops and things like that um, and this this again will be an interesting one to, to start unpicking um, the mechanisms behind it. Does it work? Um, if so, how is it working and why is it working? And then using this to um, compare and contrast with the stuff that we have with Operation Nightingale and any other projects out there, well, I think we'll, we'll be um, instrumental in moving this discipline forward and getting, getting recognition it deserves. Um, and in conclusion, um, again, long winded route, long way around it, but we, we, we can demonstrate that archaeology and heritage promote positive well-being. Um, we, we've got the data there. Um, we, know, we know it works and we start to get an understanding uh, why it works. And we need to build on this momentum. Like I say, we, we've got the heritage well-being is a big thing at the minute. Everybody seems to be jumping on um, the heritage well-being wagon and let's, let's, let's monopolise on this and let's, let's push it forward and, and really shout from the rooftops about these projects when they do work. And to help any projects that are, are interested in, in, in getting involved in this sort of um, work, you do have the... Um, and for a guidelines, which Mental Health Wellbeing Day um, has just been um, produced today, uh, just been released today, sorry. So the Amphora guidelines um, were set up um, through a round table with lots of the um, institutions that have been engaging with um, heritage wellbeing 
and they've finally produced a set of guidelines um, that will help in all different aspects of um, wellbeing projects. So if you haven't seen them yet, I would certainly recommend having a look at them. They're on the link there um, of if you Google and follow guidelines. Um, that will help be warned and forward brings up lots of things that you don't want and um, so you must be um, kind of particular in, in when you're looking for it um, and just finally there is some notes at the bottom there about the surveys that we did so um quality um, and how many people involved etc um do you have anything to add to that rich no i think that that's great it's a it's very good timing the amphora has come out today and I, I totally agree with that. Having a look at it, it's certainly something Op Nightingale um, endorses. We're part of the discussion, so I think that's going to be really important that we can um, we can uh, get some sort of standardised approach to a lot of this stuff and recognise what what seems to work. Brilliant. On that, I'm uh, I'm done. A little bit early. No, that's that's uh, that's really great. Thank you very much both um, for those really interesting talks and um, always a pleasure to hear you talk uh, because it's always so optimistic and um, I know uh, Kevin has put in the in the chat um, about a similar project in Suffolk and Norfolk the Restoration Trust partly funded by the NHS about heritage-based projects um, for mental health issues in the community so I think um, social prescribing um and i think it's been more recognized that our children heritage is a very very good and useful way for people to um to to, to start to tackle their their mental health um any mental health problems that they have i think it's very largely down to project uh, operation nightingale in the first place that um that people have become aware of it. So um, I was really interested to find out what the next step is. I think it's brilliant that you've got some um, some data now. So once you've got the data, you know, it opens up new projects, perhaps new funding. Um, so I'm just having a little bit of a scroll through. Uh, through um, Question from Martin um, saying, as I understand it, the effects were measured at exit against baseline do the benefits persist after six months um actually richard said something about it but do you have any any facts and figures dickie about that no this is something that we're looking at now and this is a very difficult one to measure actually because because of the very nature of the people that come in our projects most of them do suffer from uh, mental ill health um so to look for that long-term effect it, it, it's not, it's not going to happen um, because life gets in the way. And we do notice that when you come on these projects, people, if we did our exit, uh, our exit scales maybe three days before the end of the project, I think we would get a better scale, a better score than we would do if we did it on the end of the uh, end of the project because people leaving the projects are going back to real life. And real life for a lot of these people isn't particularly great. It's going back to build, it's going back to um, inequalities. It's, it's going back to the, um, the rum drum of life as we all, as we all face sometimes. Um, so we can't accurately measure the, the fall off of these projects, but what we have seen is um, well-being does decrease when you do leave the projects, as you would expect. But what happens is we get that same uptake in well-being, and um, so well-being does increase again um, when they come back on the project. So that that that, that is um, quite an interesting find, really. I wondered if you'd um, had if you should continue to get feedback from people who have carried on and gone into archaeology and made their made it their career because it seems to me you've got quite a quite a reasonable proportion of people who've participated who have decided that archaeology is something they want to pursue so are you still in contact with those people and how are they faring yeah we, we are indeed um they all seem to be doing very well um i, I think the problem is when people when you take up something for an occupation uh, as opposed to something to, to make yourself feel a little bit better I, I think the promises do change a little bit and i think you're right i think it will it would be good to speak to people like kennedy uh, kenny and um and some of the other guys that have gone through and just assess how they are it'd be difficult to measure any change because the scores we have from them are probably seven or eight years old so it would be difficult to validate but it, it would certainly be as a as an exercise to see if they are still enjoying um, heritage might be an interesting one. 
it's nice to get them back to kind of impart some of the knowledge they picked up as professionals to some of the newer participants on the program. And we had Kenny back for the first time in gosh, six or seven years um, this summer to help on one of the excavation pieces. So um, that's good. But I, I, as Dickie says, I don't, I don't know how you'd, you'd measure um, his, his well-being components now. I mean, it, what's also good for us is when people leave and we sort of don't, sort of don't hear from them again. It's a strange one. You know, they, they leave, you, you'll keep in touch with them on Facebook or Twitter or something like that. But we don't see them on the field projects because perhaps they, they don't really need it, maybe. And the mechanisms worked. Well, I think that's also a, another way of measuring success. As, as long as we know that they, ha they haven't gone off grid and uh, gone into some serious decline, if they've just gone off and a sort of facility, they've come into these projects, it, it shows that they are able to get back on again in life. And and, and like Richard said many times before um, in conferences, we're not here to provide, we don't want to provide a crutch for people. Uh, we don't want to provide um, a, um, a, a place for people to run and hide and not get on with life. We're here to facilitate that recovery come to us for a little bit use us as a crutch and as soon as they're able to they can then go off and, and engage with life again really independently yeah i think um i think you hit it on the uh, on the head when you said it was different if you if it's a career and different as if you from from using it as a project and um i i did wonder what the results might be if you did the same the same exit uh, on people who were sort of leaving an archaeological job so it is interesting, but it does it does seem to be very therapeutic for people. And I, I wonder whether part of it is because there on a lot of sort of um, social projects, I think there's there's that need to engage constantly with people. And as you said, with archaeology, a bit like I suppose gardening, which is another thing that's often used for um, social prescribing, you don't have to constantly talk to people. You're part of a team, but you're engaging with something that you don't have to actually constantly be cheery about you can just get on with it you can be with your own thoughts and work through them so i think from that point of view for me that 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 seems to me um how it might work and certainly how i've observed it work myself as when i've been working in excavations in the past that you can just get on with it and not constantly be talking to other people so it, it really is, and I, I suppose one, one of the beats of these projects, most of the people on the projects have got lived experience of mental health, um, and, a certain, and all the staff on the project have at least got a working knowledge of, of how these things work. Um, so people understand that. You, you, you get that aura from people sometimes, you know, they just start there, they're working away, and you think, okay, maybe leave them alone for a little bit now, just sit there, let them get on with it, um, and just keep an eye on them. Um, but also, that digging away, um, that excavating really concentrate on, on, on what you're doing it gives you a headspace to, to not mm. think about not have that oppressive thought all the time thinking about whatever you want it may be you're able to sit and just concentrate on what you're doing and just forget about things um, so it does it, it gives you that cathartic um, element of it but also then that, that talking sometimes really is helpful um, in a sense sh sh um, sharing a grave you know excavating away and you just start chatting the conversations I'm sure which will agree have been absolutely bizarre sometimes ranging on lunacy to everything in between um you do get some really interesting chat coming from these uh, projects but it's all it's all done I don't know it's just it's just magical to watch it really is sometimes I know it sounds like a really weird way to say it but watching these guys engaging and and coming away from a project on a high it, it's fantastic it really is well thank you very much for that um there's no more questions in the chat but we will have, I think, a little bit of an opportunity to come back to, to questions for all the speakers later. What we're going to do now um, is we're going to take a about 15 minutes break. So I'm going to uh, attempt to put a timer mm. on. Um, the recording will, will carry on. Um, Hi, uh, it, it's actually going to be a half hour. So we're gonna get oh, the recording okay. up and running at quarter past four. That's the time. Uh, okay. So, so, so a um, bit of a nice lengthy break. Feel free it to is. <laughs> okay. Well, no, no, that's great. We have uh, one speaker who might be running a bit late. So we will um, come back later and um, keep an eye on your screen and it'll let you know the countdown if I manage to put this timer on properly. And um, go and have yourself a cup of tea and we'll see you shortly.
Hello everyone. I'm hoping everyone's back and feeling refreshed. Um, our final talk this afternoon is by Jane Miller and is called Lifelong Learning, as you can see, Lifelong Learning in Lockdown. Um, Jane is a learning officer with Archaeology Scotland and she's recorded her presentation. Um, she's going to join us a little bit later on for some questions and answers. And this talk is about um, a project with people living with dementia. Hello everyone, I'm Jane. I'm Learning Officer at Archaeology Scotland. And I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. We're out and about with schools today, but hopefully I'll be able to join you later for the Q&A, Wi-Fi permitting. I'm going to share a project we delivered during the pandemic, which was all about making online interaction engaging, which is rather ironic as I'm presenting this in the least engaging way possible. But it was an absolutely lovely project to be involved in, and I'm really pleased that I've been asked to share it with you today. So in the summer of 2020, we received funding from Falkirk Health and Social Care Partnership to create handling kits for people living with dementia and their families and carers. Of course, working with people living with dementia is not our area of expertise. So I got in touch with Alzheimer's Scotland, who were amazingly helpful. And it turned out that our dementia advisor for the area we were working in had an archaeology degree. So she was really enthusiastic and supportive. The first step was to make sure that all our staff had a basic understanding of dementia and the difficulties faced by people living with the disease and also their family members because they were often their carers. The next thing to think about was how do we co-create a resource during lockdown and specifically a resource for a very vulnerable group. And I say co-create because that's really important to us. I always refer back to the mantra we had when I worked in museums, do not about us without us. So how could we co-create a handling kit with people living with dementia during lockdown? So during lockdown, Alzheimer's Scotland's groups, like their dementia cafe groups, had moved online. So if we were having to move our engagement with this audience online, there were two key issues for me. Firstly, could we make online workshops engaging enough? And the second issue was about the approach we should take. Most handling kits for older people focus on reminiscence, but the local museum service already had that covered. And I was concerned about the impact of this type of work when people were so isolated. I know from my work in museums that reminiscence work can sometimes be upsetting for participants. If you're face to face in a group, you can probably deal with this and support the person through it. But if the workshops are online, you probably wouldn't know if someone was struggling and you certainly couldn't help them. So we decided on a different approach. We decided to look at an approach taken by Tunbridge Wells Museum based on their research project with Canterbury Christchurch University and the Alzheimer's Society. They developed the new learning model, which wasn't about reminiscence, but about exploring, questioning and learning something new together. It was object based, so an ideal approach when thinking about archaeology handling kits and they produce a toolkit which is available online and I'll share the link to that later on. So having decided on the approach we we're going to take, we needed to find some groups to work with and this is where our contacts at Alzheimer's Scotland came in. We were able to engage with audiences already supported by Alzheimer's Scotland through their dementia cafe networks. The cafe facilitators had worked hard to get participants online using Teams, which made our job so much easier. The aim of the pilot workshop was to find out what objects and activities really engaged the participants, and this would inform the selection of objects for the handling kits. To make the online workshops more engaging, I posted out multi-sensory packs to participants the week before each workshop. And these item, items stimulated touch, smell, sight, and it was the next best thing to handing around artefacts at a time when that was impossible. Items in the packs were all clearly labelled, so it was easy for participants to take part. In November 2020, we delivered the pilot workshop to four different groups using the object-based new learning model. The first workshop was an introduction to Scottish archaeology. Workshops consisted of short PowerPoint presentations interspersed with activities and on-screen object sharing. Objects discussed during the workshop included artefacts like this polished stone axe head and spindle whirl, 
and replicas of iconic objects like the Tully Ball and the Lewis chess pieces. Items that were sent out to participants to enhance engagement with the objects included stinky raw sheep's fleece to smell when we were talking about Viking spinning and carded fleece to tease out and twist while I was demonstrating how to use a drop spindle. Um, a small polished pebble to touch when I showed them a Neolithic polished stone axe head. But we also used visuals and audio in the PowerPoints to stimulate discussions. And the, the loose chess pieces prompted a lot of chat. They're so inspiring. One participant recognised the carving on the back of the King's chair and said that she'd seen something similar in a church in Norway when she'd been on, on holiday. I'm now going to show you a, a wee clip from one of the PowerPoints uh, and this little clip prompted a lot of discussion. of the north, where the black rocks stand guard against the cold sea. In the dark night that is very long, the men of the Northlands sit by the great log fires and they tell a tale. They tell how a prince built a long ship and sailed in it beyond the black ice at the edge of the world to bring home his bride from the land of the midnight sun. Noggin the Nog was the name of the prince, young and strong and fair as the men of the Northlands are. And he was the son of Knut, king of the Nogs, the ruler of this land of dark forest and snow. I'm sure many of you will have recognised Nogin the Nog, um, said to have been inspired by the Lewis chess pieces. And that clip really made me think, although we'd not set out to encourage reminiscence, people, people just spontaneously shared their memories. One gentleman disappeared from the screen after I shared the clip and returned with a Nog in the Nog book that he'd read to his children. So I guess it's just natural, isn't it? It's human nature to reminisce. Following the successful pilot workshops, we were then asked if we would run a monthly online archaeology club. So we responded to the feedback we'd received from participants and developed workshops that were inspired by place, for example, we have the, the pineapple near Earth, and all these places are round about Falkirk where the participants lived. The Lockkeeper's Cottage in Falkirk, the Antonine Wall, and we also had a wee summer trip over to the Ardnamurchan Peninsula to visit the Swardleby Viking boat burial. Uh, these were all sites that our own archaeologists had been involved with. Um, so we could share the findings from our own excavations. The focus of the online workshops, as I said, were places near Falkirk where the participants lived and sites where we at Archaeology Scotland had previously carried out fieldwork. And the Pineapple was one of these places. I'm sure people joining us from Scotland will be familiar with this amazing site. Um, it was construction on the Walled Garden began in 1761 um, and the site is located within the Dunmore estate. Um, near Falkirk. So I'll just share some of this workshop with you now just to give you a feel for how the sessions were delivered. During the online workshops we'd explore sites together, often starting with historic maps and thinking about what the maps tell us. As you can see here the key from this 1862 map tells us that the area is shaded blue show buildings made of glass and you can see the glass here, here and here. So we then went on to discuss what we thought that told us about the site. Then looking at the building on the ground, there are other interesting features about the building. You can see the blank walls underneath the small windows. You can see those here and here. And if we compare the photo of the main pineapple building today to the plan of it on the 1862 map, we can see that there were glass houses on the front of the building. And sure enough, when we search the archives for old photos, this is what we find. So as well as the stone pineapple on top of the pavilion, the walled garden featured a number of heated glass houses for growing pineapples. And the glass houses were visible here in 1917. 
and even if we go further back to 1899. So this is the part of the site excavated by our own team and some local young people. They found lots of plant pot sheds, pieces of glass, nail and other metal fittings. After looking at the finds, we had a discussion about what they tell us about the building that had been there. We then looked at the site photos and you can see the underfloor channels here. Again, we had a chat about their purpose and it was really interesting because within the group we had people with lots of different backgrounds, engineers, builders, lots of different people. So they, they enjoyed having that discussion about the purpose of the building and they recognised some of the features. We then looked at something similar which was excavated in a, within a walled garden in East Lothian. Um, and you can see here it's the, the tiled high cost and cast iron pipe heating system in a heated glass house. And this glass house was specifically designed for growing pineapples. So we may have had heated glass houses at the pineapple too. The workshops all had a similar format so participants knew what to expect. We'd do some simple research looking at old maps, photos and documents and then we'd have a fun quiz followed by an activity. And this was our pineapple themed quiz. We had a plan of a glass house for growing pineapples from the late 18th, early 19th century. Uh, and then we had a, a, a short quiz trying to get people to guess what these used to be called. So the heated greenhouses for growing pineapples at this time had a special name. So what do you think it was? Pine Chapel? Glassy McGlass House? Pinery Vinery? Or Tropical Tile House? Uh, so we had a bit of fun with this. Um, I'm not sure anybody got it right, but as many of you will know, it's a pinery vinery. Although the theme of the workshops was place-based, within each workshop we'd have activities which were inspired by artefacts. So we have, uh, we looked at a Roman coin hoard discovered by workmen in Falkirk in the 1930s. The Stenhouse pottery and more recent artefacts like crisp packets and drinks containers. The activity each time used modelling clay which was sent out in the packs the week before the session. Uh, in one of these activities we looked at pottery produced in Stenhouse Muir near Falkirk and thanks to Falkirk Community Trust for these Stenhouse pottery slides that we used. So Stenhouse pottery was produced in Stenhouse Muir. The pots were made during the 14th and 15th centuries it was the first large scale pottery in the area and there were at least 11 kilns found on site, but there may have been many more. The most common products of the pottery were shoulder jugs with a single handle and a large number of the vessels had face masks and these were attached to the rims, sometimes the shoulders, and each face is individual and they have a variety of expressions. So you can see how inspiring these were for a, a modelling clay activity. So at this point, all participants were given a minute or two to make their own Stenhouse pottery face mask using the modelling clay provided. And we had a little bit of music to help them along as well. great feedback from the participants and the carers and Alzheimer's Scotland staff as well and probably the most moving was from a lady whose husband was in her own words usually quite non-verbal but after the session talked about how much she enjoyed it and how he was looking forward to the next one and this is just from another activity that we did um, we looked at glass Romano British beads and everyone had a go at kind of making their own using the modelling clay and you can see how much everyone enjoys the activities. We were really delighted to be nominated for and, and be joint winners um, of, the of the Council for British Archaeology's Archaeological Achievement Awards in the Engagement and Participation category. And even more delighted to be able to meet one of the participants and Alzheimer's Scotland staff members 
in person for the very first time at the Pineapple to show off our award and to finally meet face to face and be able to chat about the work that we've done. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I appreciate it's a bit droney when <laughs> somebody's pre-recorded their session, but hopefully I'll be able to join you soon for the Q&A session. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. That was um, that was really interesting and what a lovely project that was. And uh, great to be reminded of a vision on with for those who remember it with the music at the end there. So what I'd like to do now, because Jane has joined us, is um, is to take any questions uh, for Jane. Jane, I wonder if you'd just like to um, to unmute yourself and and say a hello. Hello everyone, um, yes, nice to join you, slightly frazzled, been working with school groups all day, but uh, nice to be here. Um, if anybody's got any questions, um, there's none in the chat, but we could actually throw it open, I think, uh, to the floor if anyone has got a question, if you want to stick your virtual hand up or put your camera on and stick your real hand up, um, any questions for Jane? And as Jen said in the chat, congratulations on the award as well. That's a, that's a really great achievement. I think what it shows is what a, a wonderfully um, tactile and sensory um, medium archaeology is for people. And those senses can be reawakened or, or kept awake by, by being able to touch something and have memories. I've um, not been involved in reminiscence projects but have, have known previous colleagues who have been mainly with uh, objects from from the world wars but but using archaeology I think is, is is lovely this is where replicas really do come in um, to their own as well so um, has anybody got any questions I'm just going to try and keep my eyes out for hands that are sticking up virtually <laughs> well I'm on two screens so bear with me if I don't see you. Just flicking between the two. How did you start the project, Jane? I'll just uh, chat for um, a while and talk. Yeah, yeah, well, it wasn't, it wasn't really me who started it. We, um, I think it was before I started, somebody managed to get some funding in to run, a pro well, to, to develop the handling kits, basically. Um, and then when I started, it, I started to look at how we could do that. And obviously COVID hit. And uh, <laughs> so it was just really, we kind of got that funding. I think we talked in the past about working with that audience. Um, and it just kind of was something that slightly organically grew, really, um, rather than being completely thought through. Since then, we've we've developed that work and integrated it into the work we do the, the intergenerational work we do. So now when I'm doing a project with a school group and they are now going into a local care home and sharing their work and using the work I did with the project with people living with dementia, sort of suggesting activities that they might want to develop. So the young people have developed activities that they then take into the care home for the older people to do. So we kind of were, it was a really good experience and we want to build on that really. It has never actually occurred to me uh, the impact that COVID would ha must have had on handling um, collections, because this is kind of where handling collections go wrong, really, isn't it? The one thing you can't do under a pandemic is hand things around and, and spread everything. So um, that must have been quite a quite a blow to the project. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that was, and I think for a lot of the work that we do, things became tricky, but um, we, we managed to keep our handling kits going through most of the pandemic, not at the very start, but through most of it, just with a lot of cleaning and a lot of time in between loans, uh, because we realised that the schools were actually really keen to get that kind of resource because they couldn't go on museum visits, they couldn't get people in. So anything additional they could get, they were really keen to get. So so we were we were able to keep that running, but being very careful at the same time. It, we heard such um, such sad stories from care homes, and it must have been a very isolating time for everybody. Um, oh, there's a, a comment in the chat from Perry to say how much um, they enjoyed your presentation. 
and and it inspired and uh, it was inspiring and moving and shows how important it is to steadily build partnerships and collaborations with groups in other sectors and I do think that is that's really true um actually in every part of of archaeology and and we've heard some really good examples today of how that's of how that's worked really well um Kevin, I wondered if uh, if you saw some parallels with your project because it is moving on a little bit to 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 a slightly older um, older group of people. But I I think part of what came over from your project was kind of having something to do to, together. It was a communal activity, um, but also having a bit of agency as well, um, because this is what you lose. I think as you get older, you 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 lose being in control, especially when you're in a care home. So I wonder if you had any thoughts on, on the parallels between your projects. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you're right. I, there, there are, I mean, um, in, in that sense, I mean, uh, particularly the, the museum uh, involvement that, that we have, the local museum, I mean, obviously they, they are in uh, much more, they much much more of a, an idea about engaging, particularly, uh, you know, a disabled audience who can't necessarily make it to the museum, or organising the, the museum to make it more accessible for for disabled. Um, I don't know that that we've actually got a, a kind of an Alzheimer's um, connection, although you know most of us are of an age where we are aware of. of um, our facilities, you know, particularly obviously memory, um, sometimes, um, you know, um, letting us down. And, and, and yeah, I mean, in, in that sense, I, I guess it is that kind of, you know, are, are we too old to, 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 to even be bothered anymore with kind of intellectual pursuits or, or community involvement? Or, you know, is there something we can actually do that, that you know, uh, probably we hadn't thought of, but that actually kind of leads us in that direction. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, we have plans, for example, for next year, uh, you know, over the open house weekend that, that most places seem to have around about September, that, you know, some of our research, at least we'll put on a, a poster display. And then somebody else suggested, well, actually, we could do kind of guided tours of some of the areas as well, particularly, obviously, the the, the street and, and again you know these are kind of initiatives that kind of came out of the group being together that I doubt people would have thought of if they'd been on their own or or wouldn't have thought that there was any support or wouldn't have thought that there was you know the facility to do it so so I definitely agree with that idea that creating the communities can in itself you know be almost a, a stepping stone to, to sort of other activities and, and obviously more engagement with, with a, a wider audience. Thank you. I mean, that leads on to a comment that Jen's put in the um, in the chat and um, saying that it's uh, the it's lovely that the project brings people of different ages together and involve children um, and raised awareness of dementia. So Jen's question is, did you get any positive feedback from the family members and carers? Because she's noticed uh, how people's mood can be changed drastically after engagement and activity. Um, so what was the feedback from from everybody around the participants? Yeah, I think most of the positive feedback we had was from the carers. So usually people would join online. So there'd be the person living with dementia and they would attend with a carer who was usually a close family member. We had daughters joining their mothers and fathers and we had spouses joining. And like I say, most of the positive feedback we got was from them saying, about that kind of mood change so that they, they noticed that um, the person living with dementia was uh, a bit more talkative and a bit happier after the session. And I think a lot of the, the carers just enjoyed it themselves because there was a lot of chats and it was very interactive and they just enjoyed that little break and a chance to get involved as well. So it was, it, yeah, it was lovely. The feedback we got it was really nice. Um, thank you very much for putting the link to the Dementia Toolkit in the chat. For anyone who's not seen it, it's there. Um, have a look. And that possibly answers part of um, the question from Alexandra, who is asking how you start a similar sort of project and, and what 
do you not do? What's the things to avoid? I think the first thing is get in touch with Alzheimer's Scotland. So I just Googled um, Alzheimer's Scotland in Falkirk, which is where we were working. And I got the name of their dementia advisor in the area and got in touch with her. And she was fantastic. I mean, we were very lucky that she was so supportive. But uh, I think the staff at Alzheimer's Scotland are often looking for people who can engage with their um, the people living with dementia. You know, they're looking for that kind of input. So they're usually pretty open and supportive. Um, so the first thing I would say is get in touch with them. Like, say, they, they delivered Dementia Friends training to all our staff, which I think is really fantastic. And it's, you know, it's, I think it's useful for anybody, no matter what you do. Um, so that's a good starting point, and they will point you in the right direction, you know, how you should approach people, um, how you get in touch with groups, and they quite often run groups. So I don't think there's any don'ts, it's just um, get some advice from the experts first. Um, but, you know, I'm also very happy to speak to anybody if they want to email me uh, and chat to me. But uh, I think generally, as archaeologists, we are very open and friendly people, so I think yeah, that's very much appreciated. I think it's it's very interesting to think about when we engage as, as archaeologists and heritage professionals, what it gives back to us. In actual fact, it, I think it gives us almost, if not more, back than than it does for the group that we're working with. Um, I just wanted to to go back maybe to to Richard or or Dickie at this point to to ask about their project and whether you've seen a similar thing happening with your participants in that once they have is there a sort of getting back in control of uh, of your life is that is that something you've noticed with your participants um in their engagement um I, th I think yeah I, I think the, the the lack of control or the, or the um the aspect where they're not in control is is when when they are struggling so when when they are um, at rock bottom when they're struggling with mental health or whatever it may be um and like we said earlier we want them to get to a position where they leave us and at the point where they leave us that's when they regain control of what they're doing they're able to then um interact in a way that is beneficial for them or meaningful for them and re-engage with the wider workspace of family, um, society, whatever it may be. Um, that control is a really interesting thing though. Um, being able to regain control, it, yeah, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? It enables you to then just get on with things and just carry on with your normal routine and, uh, and be productive. Thank you. Um, has anybody got any further questions for either Jane or for Anybody else who's spoken um, already today? I think we've heard such a such a, a, a diversity of talks um, going back to Martin's at the beginning, who is giving a different route for people who who are wanting to further their careers to get into specialisms, and we've heard about such a wide range of, of ways to engage people with, with archaeology beyond the traditional roots. And I think we can all agree that, that one size and one way doesn't really fit all. So what we need to make sure that there's plenty of ways to get involved for all those people who we think might benefit or who want to be involved and stay involved with archaeology. Um, some routes will lead to careers in archaeology, as we've seen already, others to a new interest, and sometimes archaeology itself is the, is the bridge to a new chapter, the next chapter in people's lives. And there's been some, some key words that have come up in quite a few of the talks, things like um, bonding and teamwork and community and diversity. But what stood out for me um, was actually the joy of discovery and learning new things and how that can enrich our lives and, and our careers. So if there's no more questions, I'm just going to have a quick look in the, in the chat. Um, I think we can call a slightly early end to the day. And I wanted to thank everybody, especially our speakers, 
um, for the fantastic presentations that they've given us. Um, and also uh, everybody else for, for turning up and, and listening and participating. And I really hope that you're going to stay with the rest of the Innovation Festival. We've got some, some really interesting sessions coming up. And um, thank you very much for taking part. And have a good evening, everybody. This virtual round of applause for everybody. The real one. <laughs>